Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Duffy, and on behalf of Governor Cuomo, I'm going to welcome you all to the New York Rising Community Spring Conference. Uh, we last met in October of 2013 right here in Albany, and we're very proud to welcome you back and welcome any, anyone who was here for the very first time. We want to extend a special welcome to the New York Rising Community's uh, members who are joining us today. And uh, again, thank you for many of you have traveled quite a long ways to be here today. I want to thank the governor for convening again this very, very special group of stakeholders, community leaders who are here. Uh, and we also want to thank you for all the efforts you put through rebuilding after three major storms that this state has faced, three major disasters, and, and all the work that you have done to bring the state back to where we are today. And so a lot of people, and especially all of us, owe you all a great debt of gratitude. We have a very short video to show you before the program begins, so please watch the screens. It looked like a war zone. We had five feet of water coming down Main Street. Oh my goodness. It was so destructive. We had no power here for about 10 days. We were, um, Really <clears throat> People prepared, but not as well as they should have because we didn't expect four, five, six feet of water coming into our streets. Our community is very, very strong. Um, resilience doesn't even begin to describe Margaretville. I really believe this community did come together. We took on the name uh, Neighbors Helping Neighbors because at that point we, we went out with truckloads and some people and said, we're just your neighbor and we need to help you. The fact that we really needed to rely on each other during the recovery part of it um, was uh, just a real a moment of challenge and shock, but also of, of, of hope that we could make it together. This community is a very resilient community, and we had already started talking probably day one after the storm about what we needed to do to recover, to rebuild, and, and to sustain ourselves again. The New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program is a community-based program to help restore and rebuild our community post-Sandy. This says to the local community, you organize, you decide what needs to be done, and we'll fund your vision. Let's go for what we can. Let's not, let's not be small-minded about this, but let's, let's look at the larger picture. It's the community. Uh, coming together with the assistance of government, but the community making the decisions that are going to impact their long-term future. To be able to talk it out amongst everyone uh, in one place and find that we all had similar uh, things that we wanted to accomplish through New York Rising and, and working together for everyone, for the good of all, the, the community, it, it was wonderful for me. It gives us hope. You know, we would not be able to do these projects that, we're, that we need to do. We would just not be able to do it. We're not just thinking of today. We're thinking of the long-range project, which is along with the vision that our committee set out to do. We are looking to make our area stronger. Stronger than ever. More resilient together. This is where we live. This is where we want our children and our grandchildren to grow up. We want everybody's support to bring all families back home.
day and sets the tone for us. Uh, I also want to welcome on behalf of the governor in the audience today. We have several members of the state legislature. We have a number of uh, local elected officials and also uh, members of the governor's great staff of commissioners and deputy secretaries who are throughout the audience. I want to welcome them. And to start off today's speaking program, uh, I want to introduce uh, a man who has been a great leader throughout these tragedies, who's been, a, a, again, a force on the ground in Suffolk County, a great partner to the governor and the state. Please welcome County Executive of Suffolk County, Steve Ballone. Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your leadership and the work you've been doing to support uh, Suffolk County and your work around the state. I'm very happy to be back here uh, with all of my colleagues and friends from Suffolk County and from across the state. And I'd like to acknowledge some of my colleagues at the county level who are with us. Of course, my good friend and partner on so many levels, uh, Nassau County Executive Ed Mangano. Uh, Montgomery County Executive Matt Ossenfort. Essex County Chairman Randy Douglas, and Schenectady County Chairman Anthony Jasensky. And most importantly, I want to thank Governor Cuomo for bringing us all together once again to discuss our recovery efforts. And to thank him also for his great leadership during Superstorm Sandy. You know, for us in Suffolk County, uh, we've been hit by a number of natural disasters uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, wildfires, historic blizzards, and of course, <clears throat> Superstorm Sandy. And the governor, and governor, I want to thank you on behalf of all the people of Suffolk County, was with us from the very beginning and throughout each of those events, and particularly with Sandy as our community has struggled to recover, Governor, your direct and very strong leadership every step of the way in this process has been inspiring and uplifting to those who have been struggling to recover, those individuals and our communities as a whole. So thank you, Governor, for your leadership. <laughs> and Governor, since Sandy, I've been proud to join your efforts to reimagine New York for a new, more severe weather reality. We've been planning for the future so that when the next storm hits, and we know at some point, though we pray it won't, we know it will come, that we are ready. Last year, the governor announced the New York rising communities that brought so many of us to the table, infrastructure experts, first responders, businesses, homeowners, transit workers, all of us coming together to come up with the best way to adequately arm our communities against the next storm. Safety and our ability to prepare, respond, and rebuild after these events are key factors in improving New York's resilience moving forward. The one silver lining in the aftermath of Sandy was that the community came together. We saw this very clearly in Suffolk County and we were committed to working together to rebuild. And under the governor's leadership, the state has harnessed that energy and used it to, to make what had been incredibly destructive into something productive and making us stronger as a community. And it's actually working. You know, we've all read stories about post-storm recovery efforts that are struggling, or that have failed. But by contrast, what is happening here, the work that is being done here, New York Rising has been innovative and effective and is making us stronger. Today's conference furthers that effort by investing in new ideas that will continue to better prepare our towns and our villages for the next extreme weather event. Over the last 17 months, Suffolk County has come a long way. And I am confident that with the state's continued support, we will use these challenges as an opportunity to make our communities stronger, smarter, and more resilient than they have ever been. 
And I thank each and every one of you, particularly my friends and colleagues in Suffolk County, for the great work that you have been doing. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to my good friend and, and partner and somebody who has worked with us to assist us uh, in some of those uh, natural disasters I spoke about. Uh, that's County Executive Ed Mangano, Nassau County Executive. Thank you, Steve, and it's a pleasure to join with you, as well as Governor Cuomo, my colleagues in government, and most importantly, my fellow residents and Sandy survivors from Nassau County. It's been almost a year and a half since Hurricane Sandy hit our state, but many of us in Nassau County remember the storm as if it was yesterday. Homes were destroyed, businesses destroyed, and our infrastructure decimated. But we've come a long way since then. The governor worked with our congressional delegation and many people in attendance today to get our fair share of federal aid immediately following the storm providing critical financial assistance to impacted homeowners and businesses, as well as local government. With that funding, the state is leading an effort to jumpstart vital projects on Long Island, including in Nassau County, the Bay Park Wastewater <coughs> Treatment Plant, which was awarded over $800 million from the state. Thank you, Governor Cuomo. In addition, the state has been helping Long Islanders repair their homes. Nearly 5,000 Nassau County residents have received over $212 million in rebuilding funds so far. St the state also overhauled LIPA and took the necessary steps to ensure that Long Islanders will never be stuck in the dark and cold without power again. Thank you, Governor Cuomo. The New York Rising program is a central part of this recovery because it's our opportunity to create a more resilient future for Long Island by empowering local communities to make their own plans for reconstruction. New York Rising is allowing Long Islanders to share their ideas and make their voice be heard about how to change our infrastructure and our communities to be better prepared for the next storm. Anyone who knows Long Islanders knows we aren't shy about offering our opinions, and this process has been no exception. The projects we're going to see today came from our communities, from community meetings, long hours of planning, and talking by representatives, residents from our towns and villages across Nassau County participated. And what makes it most exciting is that it wasn't a top-down, bureaucratic-driven approach. The people around this table used their energy, their ideas, and their commitment to build their community better, <coughs> stronger, and more resilient to come up with the plans we'll hear about today. Encouraging and fostering this participation isn't easy, especially in the midst of the largest recovery from a natural disaster that our state has ever had to undertake. But the governor and his team made it happen. And unlike some other programs government has launched after disasters, this one actually worked. I thank Governor Cuomo for his support, and we are very excited to see the results of the months of hard work our communities have put in to this process. And I thank all those that participated. And now it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Assemblyman Cusack. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you, County Exec. Uh, thank you, Governor, for, for having me here today. I'd also like to uh, recognize some of my colleagues from the New York State Assembly that are here today with us. Michael Benedetto, Assemblyman Edward Hennessy, Assemblyman Peter Lopez, Assemblyman Daniel Steck, and Assemblyman Steve Otis. Thank you for being here. Again, I want to thank, thank the governor for, for having me here today. 
Uh, and it's great to see uh, everyone who was here last time we met in this room. And uh, I look forward, to, along with my colleagues, to hearing the results of, uh, of your findings and uh, how we're going to move ahead throughout the state. Uh, you know, it's the same story that many of us have about mm. our governor. After Sandy hit, I don't know how he did it, but he was everywhere. Because when I hear from my colleagues from other parts of the state, they would say the governor was here and he brought supplies or he brought food. And I would say, how could he be there? He was just on Staten Island about <laughs> 10 minutes ago, it seemed like. And they would say, no, really, he was here. And, and, and it was true. But that's the type of man, type of leader that this governor is. <coughs> and I would say that there's no other place in this country that a governor, a leader, would say, let's solve this problem from the bottom up. You know, many of our leaders in politics and throughout the country would say, I can do this. And our governor can do this. But he knows that this is a team effort. And by everyone in this room, we have become stronger as a state. Now, many of my colleagues have talked about community. And we talked in this video about community. It's amazing. The state of New York is the largest community, I think, in this country. Because out of disaster, out of Sandy, out of all the disasters that we've had in the last couple of years, everyone in this room and every county that you represent knows the issues and the problems of the folks in Staten Island, or in the folks in Long Island, or in the North Country. And that's how it should be. That's how we become stronger. And building back to be more resilient and stronger is what New York Rising <coughs> is all about and what this governor has led us to. Now, on Staten Island and New York City, building back and building stronger is very important. But we also, with the leadership of Governor Cuomo, he realized that building isn't always the answer. Sometimes <coughs> it's better to give back to nature. You know, and that's why he started the buyback program in Staten Island, which has become very successful. And that will save lives and property, because now you will have natural areas restored, restored as blue belt or restored back to its natural state. And that takes vision to do. And that is why it's very humbling to be here and to talk about what this governor has done. This is about our future. We are all partners in whatever happens throughout this state. This is our state. Whether you're in Staten Island, whether you're in Long Island, whether you're in the North Country or Albany, <coughs> New York State is our state. And it is heartening to know that we all have each other's backs. And the person leading that charge and always has our back is Governor Cuomo. So again, Governor, I want to thank you for, for the work you've done and for building back our state and making us more resilient <coughs> and teaming up with these community leaders that are here today. Thank you again for doing this. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, who represents a beautiful area of the state, and I've been lucky enough to have been there uh, twice in the last two years or <laughs> year, uh, but each time uh, it's a quick visit. She either has me in a raft down a river or on a bobsled uh, going down. And, but I take it as a bi bipartisan uh, effort, uh, but uh, Senator Little represents the North Country. She does a fantastic job as senator, and she's doing a great job in building back New York State. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Betty Little. And it should be noted that Michael survived both. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bipartisan effort. There was nothing intended. 
<laughs> um, but both uh, events to bring people to the North Country and bring them back. So thank you, Governor, for inviting me to participate today in this event, uh, which I truly appreciate. We all know that we're coming off one of the harshest winters that we've had in a long time. And I have the privilege of representing Saranac Lake, which I think had more minus 20 degree days this year than they've had in many, many years. But after this winter, we're also reminded, as the snows melt and the rains come, of what happened in the North Country two and a half years ago. We're actually all brought here together by the power of water. And I know, and I'm sure you're the same way, when it starts to rain and it gets a little heavy, I have entirely different thoughts about what could happen than I did maybe several years ago. It's not just watering the flowers, but, uh, and it can, uh, and it did, in my area, provide a lot of devastation. So, uh, Assemblyman Dan Steck is here, and I know he <coughs> agrees with me that the North Country has been forgotten before, but we were not forgotten this time. We had Hurricane Irene, we had severe devastation, and the governor was there for us. Um, not just on paper, not just by telephone. He was there in person, came, talked to people, assured them that we would get some help. Um, got Route 73, which was totally washed out. I mean, I took a helicopter ride and, I mean, there were like just pieces of the road left. Opened in a matter of weeks, and that is like the key to getting into the North Country, into the Lake Placid, Saranac Lake area. So <clears throat> every single state resource that was available was there to help us. The governor has helped with the firehouse in Keene that was washed away into the river, replacing the firehouse in Jay, and just really seeing that the people who had damage, extreme damage to their home, got the help that they should have gotten but might not have gotten without his presence and without the leadership of the governor. But the storm is behind us, and now we have to move forward. And the idea of New York rising is the idea of moving forward. How are we going to be better? How are we going to prevent this from happening again? And what are we going to do about it? So the first conference was held last October and we had an emergency preparedness conference and, and we're back again today. But after that, the governor unveiled to us at that conference the New York State Emergency Management Certification and Training Program and announced federal approval for new wireless emergency alert system for New York State. These are forward-thinking measures. These are things that will help us as we go forward. And just in this year's budget, the governor called for and funded a state emergency preparedness college where we will train people to make sure that future generations are able to deal with some of the devastation that we have had to deal with in the past. We also have the emergency preparedness um, seminars that are being held around the state. We have one coming up fairly soon in the North Country where people are really getting involved and told how they can participate and how they can protect themselves. And these are things that every single community has to do to ensure its survival and its resiliency for coming decades. So <clears throat> we have faced de destruction and I know watching the Sandy Storm um, was unbelievable. But um, we've had de destruction in the past and unfortunately we may have it again in the future. But we have to be prepared and, uh, for these challenges that we may get in the future. But I'm also positive that uh, the leadership that we have in Governor Cuomo <clears throat> is, is really unusual because he didn't just watch, he didn't send aid, he came, he worked with us, and now through his leadership we are building better, building back better than the, we were before, and New York State will be more prepared and it will be a better state as a result of his leadership. So it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Governor Andrew Cuomo. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank Senator Betty Little for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Senator Little is uh, really the exemplar of government service done well, and uh, she's, a, she's a model for all of us to follow, so I want to thank her for those kind comments. I want to welcome all of you uh, to Albany, welcome many of you back to Albany uh, for another meeting. It's our pleasure to have you here. I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor for his leadership, uh, not just in this matter, but in uh, many of the initiatives that we've been going forward with. Let's give him a round of applause. We'll thank you. You heard from County Executive Steve Ballone and County Executive Ed Mangano. These are two gentlemen who have really earned their pay on Long Island. Uh, they, have, they have seen it all, uh, and they have seen it all repeatedly, and they have really done extraordinary, an extraordinary job. And Senator Little's word is right. It comes down to leadership. Uh, and County Executive uh, Ballone and County Executive Mangano are phenomenal leaders. Uh, I said to them one night in the middle of a snowstorm, uh, when Mother Nature was revisiting once again with her wrath. Uh, what do you make of all of this? I said, well, look, you guys started, you were good county executives. You survived this, you're going to be great county executives. <laughs> and they did. Let's give them a round of applause. To Assemblyman Michael Cusick, uh, who has really uh, done a great job on Staten Island, which was very badly damaged uh, during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and Michael's <laughs> leadership has been extraordinary. We want to thank him and thank him and give him a round of applause. <laughs> and the team that has been working on this project, um, there was no such thing as a CRZ program or a community rising program anywhere in the country. This was all created from whole cloth. Uh, we thought it was the right direction to go in, but it's a little intimidating when no one else had done it. Uh, and was mentioned earlier, government doesn't have a great track record in responding to disasters. So when we were then going to try a new approach, it was even doubly risky. Uh, but it was the right approach uh, to do it community by community, and we put together a great team to do it. And Jamie Rubin, who's the director of New York Rising Communities, and John Kamen, who's the Long Island representative. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And we talk about uh, state and county and local partnerships, uh, and, and that's what you see in this room today. Let us also remember we had another partner. We had a, a big, uh, silent partner, uh, but a very resourceful partner, which was the federal government. Uh, and the best thing we did was we got a $60 billion appropriation from the federal government. If we don't get that appropriation, and if Congress doesn't pass that appropriation, none of this happens, none of this. Uh, and the, the, the point uh, person for that was Secretary Sean Donovan in the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Holly Light from HUD is here today. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> First, to all of you, you are a special group. There is a bond among you. There is a bond among the people in your communities. Uh, because you have gone through a very difficult period, and you've gone through it together. In many ways, you've gone through a traumatic episode. Um, and that, that trauma, you can feel. And that trauma has consequences. Uh, it can bring you closer together. It can move you further apart. But it is a real phenomenon uh, to be aware of. And just for me, looking around this room and seeing the faces brings back the, the memories of some really frightening, terrible times uh, and some really ugly situations. And it brings back fear and it brings back anxiety and it brings back frustration. Uh, but that is real. It can also be turned to the positive. But it is, it is real and it is be, to be acknowledged. I was in the North Country a couple of months ago and a local official uh, came over uh, and I greeted him, and afterwards on the way home, uh, somebody I was with said, boy, when 
that local official came over, you gave him some hug like he was a brother, long lost brother. Now, I'm not normally a big hugger in general. I'm not, I get a little uncomfortable with those full hugs. I'm more of a half hug, pat on the back type of hugger. But this was a full hug, which is what caught this fellow's attention. Uh, and he said, I didn't, know, I didn't know that you knew him that well. And in truth, I didn't know him that well. I haven't known him that long, but we were through uh, storms together and floods together, and we shared moments where we were really, really frightened together uh, and anxious, and we didn't know what was going to be. And that emotion remains, and those memories remain, and those emotions bind people, and it can bind people. And that's very much true for every person in this room. We went through very, very difficult times, and we've made the best of it so far. What do you do when you go through one of these difficult times? Well, if you're smart, you say, let's learn from it. That's the intelligent response. It's not easy, but that's the intelligent response. Let's learn from it. Let's get it better from it. Let's find out what lessons we can glean from this unfortunate circumstance. And we said, well, it's going to work on two levels. There are certain things that government should do top-down, macro level. And we've been doing an exhaustive systems redevelopment. What did we learn about the power system and about electric power and where we've been putting our generating facilities and what we should have done? Should we have microgrids? Should we have more backup generators? Should we take the current facilities and raise them? How do we rebuild our roads? How do we rebuild our bridges? What do we do about water and sewage treatment systems? What do we do about our emergency management system, which was not designed to handle this severity of a situation and this frequency of a situation? And how do we come up with an emergency management system that really is equipped to handle this kind of thing? And we're opening first college ever in emergency management, homeland security here in the state of New York. We're working on training our, our forces together. We're working on training people, citizen preparedness. We're going all over the state and training people on what they should do in an emergency. Why? So they can help their neighbor, their family, et cetera, and so that they are more relaxed, God forbid it happens again and they feel prepared in their own home and in their own place. So we are doing what we should be doing on a top-down level. But we said it works on another level. And if you're really going to rebuild communities, you can't do it from Albany. You can't do it from Washington. You have to do it community <coughs> by community across the state because in truth, every community is different. Some similarities. They all got wet. That is a similarity. It was very windy. That is a similarity. But differences. And the differences, although seemingly minor, can make all the difference in the world. So really the way to do it was to go to those affected communities and say, look, we're doing everything we can on a top-down level. But the real way to do this is for you to figure out what you need. You come together. What specifically happened here? You come up with your plan, and then we will fund your plan. That's this idea. That's what you've been doing. That is what has never been done before in this situation. And that's what you have done amazingly, amazingly well. That's what this program is all about in a nutshell, funding your vision. And you did it, and let's be honest, it's easier said than done. Bring everyone together and get their ideas. Yeah, that's nice, except they're people, and people are people, and people have different ideas, and some people think this, and some people think that. And to go through that planning process, and to come up with consensus through that planning process, to find out how to divide resources which aren't enough to cover all these needs, when you really didn't even know what you were going to get at the end of the day was very, very difficult. But you did it. You did it, and I believe that your community and I believe <clears throat> this state 
will be the better for what we went through. It will be the better for we, what we went through. It's almost like what they say about life. That which doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? You go through a tough time in life, you learn from it, you get up, you go forward, you're the better for it, you learn for, for, from it. You have a certain capacity that you've gained from it. I believe that's true about our communities, especially the way you managed it, by bringing them together, forging community, finding out how to physically improve the community, you also socially improve the community because you tighten those bonds of community, you tighten that fabric. So your community will be better prepared, not just physically, but also mentally, also socially. And that is quite an achievement. So my hat is off to you for what you've done and for what you've accomplished. My hat is off to you for stepping up to the plate and assuming this responsibility when you could have very easily said, not my job, let somebody else do it. And my hat is off to you for doing what has never been done before and doing it exquisitely well. With that, my friends, let's get to work and thank you for being here. Thank you, Governor. Just uh, for a moment of personal privilege, I have a unique position of uh, having a chance to see things from, uh, from a perspective and perhaps a seat that others don't get a chance to see. And I've also had uh, many years of experience in, with emergencies and tragedies. And I will say this, uh, through three different major storms that devastated this state, as people in this room, everybody knows, uh, what I had a chance to see is this governor not give directions from a desk, not, not give orders from a bunker, uh, not be on a phone calling, but to be out like any good leader, boots on the ground, out front, uh, in all the communities that have, have been hit uh, consistently over and over again. I watched this governor listen uh, to how long it'll take to repair. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, that time frame gets whittled down to about one-tenth of what it was projected to be because he pushed and pushed and pushed. And in the worst of times, uh, people want to see, first of all, a leader who's in charge, who can uh, present a calming influence and, and make decisions and, and get things moving. This governor did that time and time and time again. And I give one example after another. Uh, I'll never forget being in Long Island, uh, if they're seeing blocks and blocks devastated by water. And this governor put the uh, Department of Financial Services out, uh, the big RV, and people who would have been on the phone calling their insurance companies and been on hold probably for days or weeks uh, had action taken that day. And it just it's little things and it's big things. Uh, but the most important thing is I've not seen any governor, any leader, do what this man has done with these major disasters three and four years, which is unprecedented, and, and the way he responded to that. Uh, it makes all of us that work on his team proud, and I know it makes his state proud, and I just want to take a moment to, on behalf of all of us, on behalf of the state, to thank Governor Cuomo uh, for his extraordinary leadership, his consistent leadership uh, during all these times, because this would not happen today uh, if it were not for him. So, Governor, I want to say thank you. And with that, the next speaker of the program, very proud to introduce Jamie Rubin, who's the Director of the Office of Storm Recovery, uh, and has done an extraordinary job, as the Governor mentioned. He's going to kick off our presentation portion this morning. Jamie? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I don't get any personal privilege, but I do want to make one comment before I start. Um, we're all here to celebrate the work that you all have done, but uh, I think it would be, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that there's another uh, whole category of activity that we're not here to discuss today, but that is the, the very difficult work of getting homeowners back in their homes. Um, and I want to acknowledge my colleague Seth Diamond and his team who are responsible for getting so much money out to homeowners who need it uh, in the last several <laughs> So, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, all of you, thank you again for the tremendous amount of time and care you've put into this program. I know how hard our team has been working mostly to keep up with you nights and days and weekends. You've generated over 700 proposed resiliency projects and we're all committed to moving them towards implementation beginning today. We've organized this section of the program around the principal themes that emerged from your work. We only have time this morning for a full presentation of a few representative projects from each category, but you should understand that behind those there are hundreds and hundreds more of just like them, and at lunchtime you'll be able to see some very elegant renderings of some of them uh, displayed in the lunchrooms. 
So our first category this morning is coastal protection. Projects include both traditional structural flood protection and more innovative natural green infrastructure strategies. And while we can only hear from one committee in depth, many others have proposed, proposed very innovative projects that address coastal protection, including Babylon, West Babylon, Broad Channel, the City of Long Beach, Howard Beach, Lindenhurst, Oakdale West Sayville, Point Lookout, Sheepshead Bay, and South Valley Stream. So now let's hear from James Shepard and Paul McDuffie about the terrific work that the Suffolk County's West Gilgo to Cap Tree Committee is proposing around coastal protection. Good morning, all. Governor Cuomo, thank you very much for this opportunity <coughs> and honor to speak about our communities and one of our future projects resulting from the Community Reconstruction Program. The New York Rising Community Reconstruction West Gilgo to Cap Tree Planning Area represents six South Shore Barrier Island communities on Long Island, united in their search for solutions to Mother Nature's challenges. The first image shows where we are on Long Island and how we truly are a shoreline barrier island <coughs> facing the Atlantic Ocean, its beauty, its, its benefits, and its risks. And while we are six separate jurisdictions, in many ways we are one community. What binds us is our nautical heritage, of which tidal wetlands have always played an integral role. In this effort, the New York Rising Community Reconstruction West Gilgo to Captree Committee collectively championed the following vision for their communities. Restore, preserve, and protect the natural resources that serve to provide habitat to a biologically diverse coastal ecosystem as well as to fortify the barrier island, shielding the south shore of Long Island against storms. The priority is to improve storm preparedness while striving to retain and protect the culture and assets that make the barrier beach communities unique and desirable to both residents and visitors. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having us. <clears throat> Frequent storms and climate change increasingly threaten the stability of the shoreline throughout the South Shore communities, taxing already compromised natural systems. Coastal wetlands and marsh ecosystems have evolved to protect the uplands from wave action and from storm surges. In the absence of a healthy ecosystem, community assets and people's homes are at even higher risk. And now they're experiencing unprecedented change and damages. Feedback <clears throat> from the public and the community about the community's experience with Superstorm Sandy and other storms in recent history revealed the following issues. A deficient storm preparedness strategy, difficulty in maintaining and resorting utilities, restoring utilities, excuse me, compromised emergency response services and timely access to them, communications during event life cycle, critical infrastructure protection, and challenges in balancing the asset protection while preserving the integrity and character <coughs> of the lifestyle of the Barrier Beach communities. Clearly identifying these critical issues guided our committee in, def <clears throat> in defining appropriate strategies for reconstruction and resiliency. Wetlands are a jewel and source of great pride for these communities. They act as a natural buffering system which provide protection against storm surges and erosive wave action. Wetlands help stabilize and protect at-risk community assets, such as homes, infrastructure, and recreational areas. They also serve as a natural filtering mechanism to improve water quality. They provide critical habitat, as well as recreational opportunities. There are approximately 1,500 acres of wetlands in the Great South Bay area. The New York State DEC estimates that an 18 to 36 percent loss in tidal wetlands in the Great South Bay occurred between 1974 and 2001, which does not include losses due to recent storm events. Rising sea level has drowned out lower-lying marshland ecosystems already destabilized by nutrient loading. These factors combi combined with repetitive battering by coastal storms have critically compromised the capacity of these wetlands to act as a buffer against future storms. Restoration involves adding substrate to support plant growth, backfilling obsolete mosquito ditches, restoring natural drainage patterns, and replanting with native grass and shrub species. I am sure that County Executive Ballone would agree that restoring the health of our water and ecosystems is an issue of critical importance 
to maintain both the sustainability and the viability of Suffolk County well into the future. And Governor, thank you for showing your commitment to this issue earlier this week. We appreciate it greatly. Okay, here you have a story that sort of uh, is told in just two, two simple pictures. The Marsh Islands in the Great South Bay are at risk of basically drowning due to their own slow degradation and sea level rise and nutrient loading. Our project would fund a pilot project for integrated marsh management that would involve rebuilding the wetlands through the usage of dredge spoils to fill in dead pans, which are low-lying, uh, you see on the left slide, um, planting of native species, and reverting mosquito ditches around the Cap Tree and Oak Island mm. area to flow better. This pilot project would alter the landscape attributes of the Marsh Islands so that they will grow and allow them to function while keeping pace with projected sea level rise. It will also reduce the risk for the 86 households and the estimated 212 people in the pilot project area of Cap Tree Island and Oak Island, as well as the Cap Tree Road and our own Oak Island Firehouse. And it will further allow the marshes to do their job and protect the mainland that lies behind it. Completed projects will restore wetland ecosystem health, the sustainability and resiliency, optimize coastal security, and economic vibrancy, protect and enhance property values, and provide enhanced habitat for valued wildlife and fisheries. Such benefits represent these communities' collective vision of the future and for achieving their greatest potential and ensuring the resiliency of the South Shore communities for generations to come. Thank you very much. We don't have any questions. I have a question. Um, I'm Jackie Milton, and I'm from the Village of Lindenhurst Committee with regarding to your coastal protection. In the Village of Lindenhurst, our Shore Road water park, waterfront park plan will protect the assets by reducing their exposure to the flood damage. Constructing a new resilient shoreline system will increase the resiliency for our homes and help keep our vulnerable our communities from being so vulnerable. What, in your opinion, is the most important benefit of your specific wetland project? Hi, good morning. Thank you for the question. Um, <coughs> the programs that you mentioned are valuable and important, but they're designed to deal with water once it gets there. They're designed to deal with water once it arrives, unfortunately. Protecting the health of the wetlands will help it work in concert together with the strength of the beachfront to create and maintain this barrier that we all depend on to hope to prevent the water from actually even entering your community. Uh, the other benefit is that in the good times, and the majority of our times are good times, is that we can enjoy the Mars system as it allows us to maintain our heritage as islanders and tenants of the Great South Bay. Thank you. Good morning, I have a question. I'm Kim Skillen from the Babylon West Babylon Committee, and I have a question for you. Um, as your neighbors to the north of the Great South Bay, I'm very excited to see your projects in restoring our uh, coastal protection. In Babylon, we're very excited about our Carl's River tributary project, which addresses our issues, uh, watershed issues, and we are looking to um, balance, we understand we need to balance our hard and soft infrastructure, and as a result, protect our community from future flooding, as well as protect our wetlands. Can you explain what are some of the benefits that the wetlands will provide which would not have been possible with the gray, with gray coastal protection intervention? Thank you for your question. Uh, I was born and raised in Babylon, and my folks still live there. I'm currently an English teacher at Babylon High School, so very familiar, obviously, with the Carls River. Um, in our particular area, uh, Barrier Island flanked by both bay and ocean, <coughs> wetlands serve to shield against wave action primarily uh, that would otherwise directly erode the Barrier Island. In essence, however, the wetlands are a barrier to the Barrier Island, a first line of defense, if you will, against erosive forces. The wetlands being a living floodplain, 
are absorptive in nature and will hold floodwaters to an extent, of course, until the natural drainage, drainage process can resume after a high tide event. When I drive home each day over the bridge you saw in our slides uh, during high tide events, uh, there is no marshland. It has literally disappeared beneath the high water. So without this first line of defense, you can imagine that those waters would be up against uh, our, our island shoreline as they would be in Babylon as well, since you are right against the Great South Bay. So uh, what the wetlands will do is hopefully serve as this absorptive first line of defense before it actually gets to the mainland, before it can go up and over and onto roads and into communities. Uh, and as I mentioned, to an extent, they will hold those waters until the natural drainage process can resume. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, first of all, I want to thank Jim and, and Paul for the great job the entire team did uh, on this, I think, very innovative project. And this is not only a community in, in Suffolk County. This is actually where I live. Um, so I'm very familiar with uh, all of these areas. And I think, number one, the, the work that's sort of underpinning uh, this presentation, uh, much of this, Governor, was done through, and I want to thank you for this, your administration and, and your team here, uh, a lot of the science of this and, and uh, you know, has, has come through your New York State 2100 Commission and the work of uh, the DEC. So I want to thank you uh, for that. And to the extent that we can be looking at solutions that restore natural ecosystems to protect ourselves from storm damage in the future, and then by their very nature, those things are leveraging other improvements and, and other um, you know, great things happening as a result of that work, restoring those natural eco ecosystems. I think that's a home run and, and really fulfills the mission, Governor, that you laid out for the, this team and every team here. That is not just to restore what was there before, but to build back better. And I, I think this is an example of truly doing that. So thank you, guys, and, and thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Thank you again. Our next category is critical facility resiliency. We all know that during and after a disaster, it's vitally important that critical public facilities, firehouses, police stations, emergency operations centers, and public works facilities remain operational. These facilities are critical to the coordination of disaster response and recovery. Projects in this category include the installation of generators and backup power sources, the elevation of mechanicals above base flood elevation, dry and wet flood proofing, and where necessary, of course, the relocation of buildings out of the floodplain. We've seen projects like this proposed by Amityville, East Massapequa, Garretson Beach, Massapequa, Meadowmere Park, Middleburg Town, Stony Point, Town of Esperance, Town of Owego, <coughs> the Village of Atlantic Beach, the Village of Massapequa Park, the Village of Nichols, and the Village of Owego. Now we'll turn to Scott Ingmeyer to hear about Madison County's critical facility resiliency proposal. Scott. Thank you very much. On behalf of Madison County, I'd uh, certainly like to thank uh, the Governor, uh, the State Department of State, and our consultants who have helped us uh, to get to the point where we are today. Madison County is located in uh, central New York, We're made up of a number of small hamlets, villages, one city, and uh, a rural character that we're quite proud of. Uh, we're also unique in that we serve as headwaters for three major watersheds, uh, including the Susquehanna, the Oswego, and the Mohawk uh, drainage basin. In the summer of 2013, uh, we experienced a number of severe uh, flood events uh, that affected uh, various parts of Madison <laughs> County. We were hit hard. Uh, and in, as an example, in the city of Oneida, uh, this, we received approximately four and a half inches of rain in a short period of time on already saturated soils. Uh, during a two-day period, uh, U.S. stream gauges, USGS stream gauges reported on Oneida Creek was over 16 feet at flood elevation. Normal flow is around three feet, and flood elevation stage is 11 feet. Uh, countywide, we saw uh, roads <coughs> and culverts were damaged by the sheer force of water uh, and, and floating debris. Homes were evacuated, businesses were destroyed, and crops were lost. Uh, looking forward to our recovery efforts uh, through the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program, Madison County is working to recover 
to build back better and stronger. We've identified a number of projects through this process initially that will help us to accomplish our goals, ranging from culvert repairs, stream bank stabilization, to housing program, and emergency municipal power generation. Two projects we'd like to highlight today are uh, the City of Oneida DPW garage uh, relocation, as well as the Town of Dreyer Cary Road stream bank stabilization project. The City of Oneida's DPW garage uh, was flooded with over four feet of water during the storm event, causing substantial damage to the building, equipment, and vehicles that were critical for the recovery process. An oil spill also occurred in the garage due to the flood. Uh, this project we're proposing will relocate the United DPW garage and fuel tanks out of the 100-year flood zone. Uh, the water department and salt shed will be uh, moved in future phases, and the city will also look to uh, implement sustainable features in these proposed new facilities. In uh, the town of Derider, the Cary Road stream bank stabilization project is characteristic of many of the issues that we experienced in the southern part of the county uh, from these storms. High velocity water, extreme flows, caused numerous issues with existing stream banks, road infrastructure, and culverts. Um, 2013 floods, uh, we saw on Cary Road, uh, damages to the road itself as well as adjacent homes. The road itself was closed for five days. Uh, the project will include over 200 linear feet of stream bank stabilization, uh, use, utilizing pinned riprap replacement, and replacing the guide rails along the stream. Uh, the benefits of these projects uh, for the city of Oneida, uh, the relocation of the DPW garage, there are many <laughs> benefits to that. First, the city has decided to lead by example in relocating essential facilities out of the floodplain. Um, additional benefits we've uh, proposed include uh, pollution prevention by relocation of fuel storage from the floodplain, an enhancement of building safety and vital services for public safety and recovery efforts. This will also help to mitigate the future loss of public infrastructure and resources. Benefits from the Cary Road project will include reestablishment of eroded uh, and washed out areas of stream bank, as well as protection of residences uh, along the road from flooding. In closing, again, I'd like to thank the governor, the New York State Department of State, our consultants, those working in Madison County, uh, and our regional partners for the opportunity to continue building back Madison County stronger. <clears throat> Questions or comments? Sir. I'm Vern Sweeney, I co chair the Storm Management Committee. Storm Point is located right on the shoreline of the Hudson River, where 12 miles, miles north of the Captain's Bridge, the storms have been related to uh, critical care facilities, protecting critical care facilities, preserving and important also the Stony community was hit by Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Irene, flooding overwhelmed culverts, <coughs> roads, isolating residents and making evacuations difficult. Storm surge from the Hudson River also badly damaged our wastewater treatment facility. The Southern Point Planning Committee looked at ways to harden this plant with things like waterproof pumps and water-resistant mechanicals to ensure continued operation Moving your DPW facility out of the 100 year floodplain makes sense. We wish you the best of luck with the support project. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Please. Hi. Good morning. My name is Doreen Garson, and I co chair the Garrison Beach Sheep's Head Bay Committee. I have a question uh, regarding the facility remo uh, moving. The Sheepshead Bay and Garrison Beach Committees is planning to retrofit two existing key facilities, the Garrison <coughs> Beach Volunteer Fire Station and the Volunteer Fi um, Memorial Training Hall to ensure that they're able to function immediately following an extreme weather event. Did you consider leaving the facility in place and flood proofing it? And how did you come to the conclusion that the facility needed to be moved? 
Thank you. Uh, yes, we did consider leaving the facility in place uh, based on the age of the structure and some damage that it, it incurred. Uh, for the, in part for those reasons, uh, we decided to move it. Additionally, we also feel that it's important as, as municipal government to lead by example. And so uh, in, in future projects that we're looking toward, uh, hopefully we're going to be moving a number of people out of the flood zone. And we think that uh, by leading by example, us doing that ourselves will certainly help our cause in the future and down the road. So thank you. Right back. Okay. Any further comments? Next category is riverine protection. Thousands of New York's communities are built along the banks of rivers and streams. Even a hard rain can cause flooding, and of course a storm the size of Irene or Lee quickly destroys homes, businesses, and infrastructure. The riverine protection category includes both traditional structural flood protection projects and more innovative green infrastructure projects. Um, our plans contain an extraordinary breadth of such projects, including some from Ellenville, Rochester, Rosendale, and Wawarsing, Herkimer County, Keene, Madison <laughs> County, Montgomery County, Town of Amsterdam, Town of Conklin, Town of Florida, the Town of Olive, Town of Saugerties, the Town of Union, Washingtonville, and Waterford. Governor, I don't know if I gave you the, the, the uh, thanks for, to me for giving me the opportunity to see some of these places. I grew up my entire <laughs> life in a one block radius. So. <laughs> this has been a, quite an education. Uh, I'll now turn the mic over to Dennis Porter and John Redente to talk about the work proposed by the Sydney <laughs> Committee in Delaware County. Okay. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to present today. Before I, before I present, I'm going to go a little bit off, off uh, topic here. Uh, it's interesting when you're involved in these kind of a situations you sometimes have an aha moment. And this is right after the second flood that hit our village. Uh, a gentleman from the Department of State was coming through and I coerced him to stop and see what was going on in our village. Uh, John Winbush stopped in and I took him all around and then, and then afterwards we stopped and had a cup of coffee and I wanna make a note that uh, he would not let me buy his coffee, he paid for his own coffee. Uh, but the important thing, he looked at me and he said, John, he says, you have a situation here, stop fighting the river, embrace it, embrace the flood zone, work with it, let it become part of your community. And, and that was a completely different direction than I think we were thinking for in the past. And with that kind of thinking, I think we started putting together the plan that we're, that we're at right now. Uh, the village of Sydney is an upstate New York rising community located in the foothills of the Catskill Mountain and along the banks of the Susquehanna River. Our village was hit hard by Hurricane Lee just five years after a record flood event in 2006. As you can see in this picture, flooding from Lee was significant. Over 400 homes, homes and businesses were flooded, entire neighborhoods were evacuated, electricity was cut off, emergency services were hampered by damage to their facilities. After Tropical Storm Lee, we came to a very difficult decision that some parts of the village simply cannot be protected from future flooding. The New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program allowed us to dig deep in our vision of how to build a future for Sydney in this new reality. We reviewed damage reports, inventory assets, evaluated risks, we heard from experts, talked to our neighbors, and we listened to each other. Central to our vision for the future is returning 140 acres of land to Mother Nature by building what we are calling the Sydney Green Plain. The Green Plain would be an area capable of storing over 12 million cubic feet of flood water. That's a swimming pool the length of a football field that was 20 stories deep. It would increase protection of our residents, reduce runoffs, remove sediment, and nutrients that are impairing the Susquehanna River of all the way down to the Chesapeake. The other benefit of this is there would be some, because of the way we are retaining this water and releasing it in slow, we have other places downstream like Afton and Bainbridge that should help from this also by lowering the amount of flooding they're gonna get. So it's in addition to what we're doing. This slide shows the second phase of our Green Plain project. It involves greeting, creating a riverfront trail a recreation, a pavilion area, as well as educational and environmental programs for all. 
at the end of New York Rising process, we can say that our vision is stronger and clearer than ever. <laughs> Backed by the technical analysis and public support, our plan works with nature, protects stream banks and corridors, reduces the impact of future flooding on our residents, and provides safe public access to the waterway that will lead to positive economic impact for the village. <laughs> Governor Cuomo, after the floods, you helped us keep our largest employer, Anthenol Aerospace, by helping them to relocate at higher ground. That assistance kept almost 1,000 jobs in our village. And, and I, I, we can't thank you enough it, what, what that meant to our village. Now we are helping achieve our goal by helping, helping families and seniors to relocate within the village and rebuild their lives. Thank <laughs> you again. Any questions? <coughs> questions or comments? Yes. Question. Good morning. My name is Rick Lewis. I am co-chair of the Village of Washingtonville Committee. Your green plane sounds wonderful, uh, your green plane plan. We are looking at doing something similar in the Village of Washingtonville. We've proposed a project uh, to study retention areas along the Moodner Creek, which uh, flooded our village back in 2011. Each of these areas will play vital roles in protecting the village from future flooding. Uh, in some cases, reducing water levels, uh, we've determined from uh, several inches to over a foot, depending on the location in the village. I'm interested in hearing more about how you plan to integrate the recreation and education components that will lead to economic growth for Sydney into the Green Plain project. Well, what we'd like to do is um, add uh, infrastructure <coughs> such as uh, cultural centers and also infrastructure to uh, uh, to use the Susquehanna River as an asset, uh, uh, having canoe races and all sorts of uh, uh, recreational opportunities along the, the banks of, uh, of our river. Uh, we, we, also, we also feel, because this is such a new idea and, 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 and it's kind of on the cutting edge, I think there's a, an opportunity for, for observing as an educational uh, to show people what can be done especially in the way of filtration of your sewer systems, uh, because depending on what kind of plants uh, we put into this kind of an area, it could also aid in filtering out our phosphorus, our, our manganese, uh, uh, nitrogen, <coughs> all kinds of, and there's even special planning now, I understand, that will help to take out some of the pharmaceutical uh, 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 products that we find in our waterways. So it, it really uh, could be a showcase for study along with a showcase for tourism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi. Go ahead. Is that me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the governor for his initiative and support on this project in our county, Montgomery County. I'm Dennis Wilson. I'm one of the co-chairs of one of the committees in Montgomery County. I'd like to also recognize the, uh, the support that the Department of State staff has been bringing to us in Montgomery County. We really appreciate their efforts. I took some uh, notes during the presentation. I, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I'd like to, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation on your bold solution to addressing flooding in your community. Your proposed project reminds us that in order to protect our communities from flooding, we have to give the, the floodwaters a place to go. Many of our Montgomery County communities are also located right on our waterways and are, are prone regularly to flooding. Last summer, Fort Plain was devastated by flash flooding, and unfortunately, while this was a particularly extreme, an extreme event, the reality is that Fort Plain and many of the communities around it are frequently flooded. Our plan considers several methods to protect Fort Plain from flooding, and including studying the potential for a flood wall. But as we move forward in our planning process, I think that we should follow your lead in thinking broadly and creatively, creatively, creatively about how we can uh, provide sufficient floodplain th so that when the waters rise again in Fort Plain and the other surrounding communities that are on the riverfront, have a, there's a place for the water to go. I think that's a great, great idea. Thank you. Jamie, if I can. Sure. The, um, I think there was a lot of wisdom in your plan and what the Department of State uh, person said to you. 
I'm glad he didn't let you pay for the coffee, by the way. That <laughs> <laughs> rules are rules. If you don't follow the rule, you know what happens. A reporter calls. The, um, the part of, we talk about lessons learned, you know, part of it is uh, an attitude adjustment. We had one attitude towards the water which was sort of let us get as close to it as possible. And uh, we devalued the, the purpose of vacant land, wetlands around the body of water. And we really just trampled on it. And a wetland is called a wetland for a reason. We saw a wetland as a waste of space, right? Here's a wetland, let's develop it. Uh, because it's just a wetland and is serving no purpose. No, there was a purpose to the wetland. There really was. Uh, and these areas where there is periodic flooding over the years, Mother Nature was trying to tell us something. That's her area. And when she comes, she's going to reclaim it. And as sophisticated we, as we are and as advanced as we are, she still wins. Manhattan, you look at a map of Manhattan. A lot of Manhattan is fill down around the southern tip of Manhattan. That's all fill. South Street Seaport down to the tip, Battery Park City, it's all fill. But it was Manhattan, so it was very creative and it was very deep fill with walls. We built skyscrapers on it. When you look at the line that Hurricane Sandy came back to, it comes right back to the original line of Manhattan in the 1700s before any of the fill. Hurricane Sandy covered all the fill areas right up to the original line of the island. She knew where she was going. She was going where she had been. We were encroaching on her territory. Well, we can tame Mother Nature. We can build big fill sites. No, you can't. You think you can, but you can't. And that attitude, I think, is important. Staten Island, to their credit, they had built Staten Island as an island. The water is very valuable. They built right of wherever you found any wetland, marsh, they built right up to the water. It was all waterfront. It was very valuable. They did a 180, and it wasn't easy, but they got entire communities to say, we shouldn't have built here. We're taking down the homes. We're relocating. We're going to higher ground, and this will be forever a wetland, which is a really dramatic turnaround from the entire attitude. But I also think it's necessary and it's important because we were encroaching. It's not that Mother Nature has done anything different than she did in the past. Maybe she does it with more frequency. But the, a shift in that attitude, which is very hard. Staten Island, we're moving dozens and dozens of homes. I mean, this is not a small undertaking. And it is uh, sociologically a very difficult thing to say to an entire community, you can't live here, or, live here anymore. But I think that, that awareness is very important uh, almost in all of these communities. You can find an area where it had flooded, it was almost designed by Mother Nature to flood, Recognizing that sort of liberates us from making the same mistake over and over and over again. But kudos to you for doing it, because it's not easily done. Thank you. It's a great project. OK, we'll move on to one final category before I think we turn it back to Lieutenant Governor to, to lead us into a break. Um, storms like Sandy, Irene, and Lee reveal weaknesses in our system. One of the things we now know is that there is a crisis of stormwater management in many of the areas of New York State. So it's no surprise that many of our committees took on stormwater management in their projects, including stormwater drainage systems, but also green infrastructure strategies like <laughs> bioswales and permeable pavement. Projects like this were proposed by Belmore, Breezy Point, the City of Amsterdam, East Atlantic Beach, 
Staten Island, Lido Beach, Mastic Beach, Smith Point of Shirley, <coughs> Merrick, Niagara County, Schoharie Town, Schoharie Village, Seaford, the town of Tioga, the village of Bayville, the village of East Rockaway, Wantaw, and West Islip. And I'll now turn it over to, Peter, to Robert Block and Peter Sobel to describe the work proposed by Nassau County's five towns. Good morning. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be spending the day in Albany with all of you. And thank you, Governor Cuomo, for the honor to present today to you and to the many committee members from across the state who are committed to building a more resilient New York. I think it is safe to say that those of us in attendance today have shared a unique experience and responsibility, <coughs> which we took very seriously and approached with a tremendous New York style pride. My name is Bob Block, and this is my friend and co-chair, Pete Sobel, and we had the honor to co-chair the New York Rising Five Towns Committee. The Five Towns is located uh, in the southwest corner of uh, Nassau County. We are boarded by Queens, the Ocean, and JFK Airport. But don't let the name fool you. The Five Towns is comprised of much more than just five communities. Our 16-member committee of two representatives from each commu community worked well together to construct our plan for our zone. The five towns is composed of four town of Hempstead hamlets, Hewlett, Inwood, Menomir Park, and Woodmere, and four incorporated villages, Cedarhurst, Lawrence, Hewlett Harbor, and Hewlett Neck. As diverse as we are, with many different ethnicities, races, religions, and socioeconomic statuses, mm -hmm. one thing is for sure. Superstorm Sandy hit us all very hard with devastating strength. But like proud New Yorkers, we united to meet the challenge and help our neighbors in need. During Sandy, the storm surge from the Atlantic Ocean traveled over the far Rockaway Peninsula and through the Jones Inlet, Rockaway Inlet, and Reynolds Channel into Jamaica Bay. The surge affected our community with tidal flooding and widespread backups within the stormwater system. As you can see on the map, the dark blue section shows the inundation from Sandy. Tides reached as high as 11 feet in some areas, and as a result, rainwater runoff caused overflows of the stormwater system and led to flooding, even in areas that were beyond the range of typical tidal flooding. One fine example of how Sandy brought us together is one that Pete and I are very proud of. In the spirit of community, each of our eight villages and hamlets agreed to allocate approximately 10% of its possible funding for a regional shared project that would benefit the five towns as a whole. These projects included the hardening of Lawrence High School, which was closed for several months due to flooding. Let me stop for a second there and just, I just want to point out, if you look at the map, our area is, is made up of two school districts. And although the Lawrence District and the Hewlett Districts might be fierce competitors on the football field. After Sandy, they were true neighbors, and the Hewlett's and the part of the Woodmere that have nothing to do with Lawrence said, yes, we want to help, and put part of their funding to restore the high school. <coughs> Other projects of the shared uh, uh, pool included the study of the South Shore coastline, the study of improving our main evacuation route, which we share with the Rockaways, and upgrades to our Five Towns <coughs> Community Center, which you, Mr. Governor, visited after the storm and witnessed firsthand how this center served as a vital shelter and resource for the people of the Five Towns. Our community will always remember the day you distributed over 750 turkeys for Thanksgiving meals, lifting the spirits of our storm-battered 
residents. <laughs> the storm brought to light many critical issues that we were well aware of, but which we didn't have the resources to tackle until the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program. These critical issues include emergency response capacity. The Menomir Park Fire Department, for instance, served as an unofficial yet essential shelter after the storm. Our community reconstruction plan includes measure to bolster the resilience of critical facilities such as this firehouse, for which a generator to maintain operations and emergency services is so vital. Access and improvement of our evacuation routes. Living so close to the water means that we need to ensure that we have access to these routes. And too often, these routes are impassable. We also need to do a better job of informing our neighbors of the existence and locations of this route. Last but not least is coastal protection and stormwater management, which you will see in more detail on the following slide. Flooding occurs regularly during heavy rains and high tides in low-lying areas along our main thoroughfares resulting in repetitive damage to our critical infrastructure. <clears throat> so you can only imagine how bad the flooding was during Sandy. There are many ways to deal with upgrading the stormwater infrastructure in our communities. Our projects to mitigate flooding is not a one size fits all and are tailored to the unique geographies and built environments of a given community. Some ways that would mitigate stormwater are Pervious paving, which substitutes the basic impermeable asphalt with materials that allow the movement of stormwater from the surface into the ground. After all, that's where the water belongs. Bioswales and rain gardens will not only provide absorption from stormwater runoff, but also will serve to enhance the beauty and cultural gathering locations within the community. Increased pipe capacity is another intervention to mitigate stormwater. Between the more frequent occurrence of rain events and aging infrastructure, increased pipe capacity of our stormwater infrastructure is a must. These pipes serve as the re repositories for runoff collected from both the typical catch basins and the new rain gardens. Overall, we have proposed nearly $20 million in stormwater infrastructure upgrades in our community's reconstruction plan. <clears throat> we are excited about the potential to build our five towns community back better with these proposed stormwater infrastructure upgrades. The increased ability to handle stormwater will benefit all eight of our communities. This will reduce property damage and also reduce the amount of resources that our cash-strapped municipalities must put towards response in future storm events. Governor, we look forward to the day you join our community and place the New York Rising shovel in our ground. On behalf of our committee and the citizens which we represent, we thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you. Questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, my name is Denise Niebel, and I'm the chair of the Breezy Point Committee. Um, let me first start off by saying I want to thank you, Governor Cuomo, um, for the support you have given the Breezy Point community and on behalf of them and enabling us to participate in this program. And I do have a question for Mr. Block and Mr. Sobel. Um, the communities of Breezy Point, Roxbury, and Rockaway Point also suffered inundation from all sides during Superstorm Sandy. Throughout the process that we went through, our committee considered ways to mitigate both coastal flooding and long-standing water issues. You mentioned that there were eight communities represented on your committee and that almost all proposed stormwater infrastructure improvements. You also mentioned a series of innovations from permeable pavement to expanded pipe capacity. 
Can you explain the process the committee used to identify the different methods to address that same goal? Well, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say if you ask me a question such as this about eight months ago, I would say I have no idea. <laughs> but today, after this process, I can say we did it more with our ears. We listened. We followed the protocol set up by the state. We worked with a fantastic team of, of professionals. We listened to our neighbors. Uh, after all, in our zone, we're working with four mayors, and they have administrations. And for the most part, they basically knew uh, what they needed and wanted to do. So our committee spent a lot of time gathering information, sharing it with our uh, professional consultants, uh, and uh, agreed on our plan. Good luck to you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Carrie Rosalia, co-chair of the Massac Beach and Shirley CRP. Governor, I'd like to thank you for having us here today and for your ongoing assistance in our community. My question for you is that your project proposes a combination of gray and green infrastructure. In Massac Beach, we also have a great opportunity to transform our green infrastructure <coughs> to capture and help mitigate our stormwater runoff. How has your community worked to find a balance between green approaches like bioswales versus traditional gray infrastructure approaches? Uh, I think the governor answered that question a few minutes ago. You listen, and in this case, you listen to the land. We study the topography and uh, the basic structure of the uh, geography of the land, and uh, with the help of our professional engineer team, um, I think what's already in place and what needed to be refurbished basically dictated uh, our plan of attack. Where, and I'll just, I'll just jump in on that. Where the experts told us there was opportunity to make the greatest impact, that's where we put the focus on. So where there was an opportunity to increase capacity through the pipe sizes, we focused there. And when there was an opportunity to restore the wetlands that provided the greatest impact, we focused there. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to have everybody give a round of applause to our four presenters. Very impressive presentations, very well thought through, and with the topic New York Rising, I think you've all risen to the, to the challenge here. So we just appreciate the work that's been done. Uh, what the governor intended when this whole process started was that people would be empowered, and I think the presentations, what you put forth, they really reflect that, the, the involvement that you've had, the teamwork, the collaboration. Uh, it makes us all very proud, so congratulations. It is time for lunch. We're gonna break, uh, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> And we wanted that the, the room temperature was really meant to mirror what Senator Little said about winter. So we want to make sure that you, hope you, hope you, uh, we don't want you to think uh, and forget that winter is just around the corner behind us. But uh, we're going to convene uh, the Heart Lounge. Uh, we'll you direct it to we'll, we'll be serving lunch for you. There's some presentations at that. Uh, we'll reconvene back here at 1245 sharp. And I want to again thank Jamie for facilitating the, the four presentations. And we'll see you at 1245. Thank you.